vision, seeing, theophany, um, one of the very important key verses leading up to the theophany in, uh, in chapter 12 is in uh, uh, chapter 12, verse 14. You get a number of instructions there given to the congregation who are running the race together with Jesus, looking to him, notice the visual language, looking to him, the author and finisher of their race. Um, uh, you get uh, athletic language then in, uh, in imagery in verse 12, 13. And then just listen to verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Earlier on, in uh, verse 10, the author had said, they, that's uh, uh, the children of God, uh, no, they, our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he, that's God our Heavenly Father, disciplines for us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. Sharing in God's holiness. God gives us his holiness through Jesus. Earlier on we saw the one who sanctifies and the ones, those who are sanctified, are of one source. They have one Father. Uh, God shares his holiness with us. For what purpose? Verse 14. That we may see the Lord. Now remember what I said about Lord yesterday? The Lord always refers to Jesus. Jesus. So the goal of God's work with us as disciples, uh, his training of us, his teaching of us, his teaching wisdom to us, the goal of all that is the vision of Jesus, to see Jesus. Uh, now only those whose consciences have been cleansed from sin and as a result of that then also share in God's holiness see the Lord now most people take this as a future thing we will see the Lord when heaven and that's true it's obviously true uh, because heaven is seeing the Lord face to face vision of God vision of Jesus uh, but uh, 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 it's also true that already now, by faith, we see Jesus. Notice that present tense, strive to live at peace uh, and for holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are those who are holy, because they not only will see the Lord, but they already now, by faith, see the Lord. Hey, lastly, to finish this uh, 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 theme, no, not finish, uh, I've still got more. Uh, through baptism, through the Word of God, through faith, we have been enlightened. That's one of the descriptions that Hebrews has of those who are Christian. They are people who have been enlightened, whose eyes have been opened, who see the light and are filled with the light. So they are theophanic people. Uh, they are filled with God, but they also then reveal God. Uh, we are enlightened, the light shines on us, the light fill, fills us, and the light of God's glory shines through us to people round about us. So we are enlightened, filled with light. Uh, we, by faith, see Jesus humbled and then also crowned with glory and honour. Uh, now, chapter 3, verse 1, uh, can you turn your Bibles there? 3 verse 1. A remarkable introduction. Therefore, holy brothers, holy brothers, priestly brothers, 
uh, who share in a heavenly calling. I think I spoke about that yesterday. We participate, we have a heavenly calling. Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Now, I don't know what comes into mind when you hear the verb consider. Um, it's quite accurate translation of the Greek verb katanoeo, uh, uh, but consider used to be a visual term. If you consider something, what do you do? Study it. Uh, how do you look at it? You don't just, oh, no. Oh, you, study it. you study it and you examine it very, very closely. You look at it, you examine it very, very closely. Uh, consider, uh, it comes from Latin word, which means it has the verb vid, uh, uh, video, which means to see. Look, com, together, look closely at something. But consider very often these days is just think about something. Uh, consider Jesus means uh, looking at Jesus, contemplating Jesus, uh, 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 looking closely at Jesus. And notice the two terms that are used here. What's the object for our consideration? Our looking, our contemplation, our vision is Jesus who is what? The apostle of God, the one sent by God to speak the word of God and to do the will of God and the high priest. So uh, the whole of Hebrews paints a picture for us of Jesus sent by God as his agent to do God's work, to speak God's word, and above all, sent by God as high priest. He's sent as our high priest. And the vision that he wants to give us is not just the vision of Jesus, but the vision of Jesus as the high priest sent from heaven to earth to be our, uh, uh, our mediator. So then, chapter 12, we look to Jesus. Uh, uh, the idea is looking up. Um, the picture is running, the, you know, we run the race of faith. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been done a, uh, a marathon, but normally one of the things you do is to get yourself relaxed. The danger is to pull up tight if you look too far ahead. So the normal way of running is to uh, look down. Just wear, take it one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a one. That's the secret of running a marathon. Uh, so you look down. But instead of looking down, Hebrews says, look up. At who? At Jesus, who is both the beginner and ender of our race, who is the founder and the uh, uh, fulfiller of our race race, the race we are running. He's run that race, he's finished that race, but he's also not only there at the end of the race, but he's running with us in the race. So uh, we don't look at ourselves because one of the tricks in, uh, uh, about marathons and long distance running is to, uh, to be able to endure. Now, endure means to, to be able to relax, but not to focus on the hurt and the tiredness, but to turn away from yourself, to be extroverted, to put your mind elsewhere. Uh, and uh, that's the secret of long distance running. So looking up to, not looking at ourselves, you know, am I going to make the finish? Do I have enough energy to finish the race? But looking to Jesus. Uh, because uh, he's the one who brings us to the goal. And uh, then uh, we already had the passage at the end of that theophany in the New Testament, uh, uh, the uh, picture of uh, that theophany ends with an imperative. See, look, look at him. See him speaking from heaven. See the one speaking from heaven. It's participle. It is no finite verb. See the one speaking from heaven. Look at the speaker. Uh, so the whole of worship is looking, not just looking at Jesus, but uh, seeing Jesus, 
who is speaker, seeing the one who speaks and seeing what he says. Uh, right out. Chapter 12 has a lot to say about vision and speaking. I don't know if you've ever really looked closely at the definition of faith at the beginning of that discussion of the great people of faith, the men and women of faith in the Old Testament. Uh, how does it go? Now faith is the assurance, the substance better, uh, the foundation. Substance means the thing that stands under, the, uh, 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 stands, standing, sub is under. Uh, so what do we stand on when we have faith? I mean, what do, what, the thing is that faith is something that we stand on. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the foundation of our hope, and then the evidence of things unseen, the proof of things unseen. Uh, so uh, uh, by faith, uh, which looks to God's promises, which pain gives us what to hope for, uh, we then uh, uh, are convinced about things that are otherwise unseen. By faith we have revealed to us invisible, unseen things. We see uh, what we otherwise can't see with our human eyes. The things that we hope for, the things that we will have not only in heaven, but by faith we already have them when? Here and now. Um, so faith is the basis, the hypostasis, the substance. Notice stance is standing, sub is uh, that which you stand on or under, um, of what is hoped for the conviction of things not seen. By faith we perceive what, uh, uh, that what appears was not made from what is seen. So by faith we see the world with different eyes. Uh, we see that the whole visible world didn't create itself, doesn't exist by itself, but it comes from and as a result of unseen things. Uh, uh, by faith we perceive that the world was created, how? By God through his word. We see what otherwise can be seen. Um, there's a bit of a controversy here in North America about evolution and about science and, and a lot of t talking alongside each other uh, uh, and there's the impression sometimes that people who oppose evolution and evolu evolutionism it is not compatible with the Bible, evolutionism, uh, but you try and argue people to believe that God created the world. Can you prove that God created the world? No. The creation of the world is an article of faith. It's as much as an article of faith as the divinity of Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. Uh, at the most, you could say uh, um, um, that uh, we don't know how the world came into existence. That's as far as science can go. Uh, uh, by faith, we perceive that what is apparent came from as a result of things that are unseen. And so faith opens our eyes to see that uh, the visible world is not all that there is. But God created that as part of a far bigger world, which is the invisible world. <coughs> and I don't just mean the invisible world. He doesn't mean of atoms and molecules that you can't see, but the spiritual invisible world. Uh, so we see what uh, uh, the origin of what is otherwise, uh, everything that has appeared. I see a lot of Romans 5 here with yes. standing and faith. Yes, indeed, indeed. Yes. Two, two heroes of faith, 
in uh, the Old Testament, uh, we read that Noah was told about invisible things. And he built the ark because he, uh, being warned by God concerning events or things that were as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. What does Moses, I mean, what does Noah see that nobody else saw? Not just the flood. But the salvation by the water. Uh, the salvation by water through the flood and that the flood was not just an accident but God's judgment. judgment. So uh, he didn't just see that the flood was coming but he through the word of God saw and by faith believed that this was God's doing. It was an act of God and that this was an act of God's judgment on human sin but also he saw, foresaw the result of it, that he would save uh, uh, people through the ark and he would save the world, which otherwise would have uh, uh, descended into chaos and disorder, saving him and the world uh, from destruction. I don't know, Noah uh, seeing uh, the invisible things. You have the w word warned there again. In warned, yes. Kramatidzo, which is right. here, he uh, was prophesied. God, okay. yes. Would you change, would you adjust that again? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, most importantly, by faith, all the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saw the things that God promised them without receiving them. They lived by faith. They foresaw what God was going to give them, but they never possessed what they hoped for. Now, what's the difference between the patriarchs who saw the things that God had promised and us? We've received them. We've received them, exactly. <clears throat> but we've received them even though they are still visible. So we've received them, yet we don't yet see them. We foresee them in that sense. Uh, playing here on the mystery of our uh, living by faith. So to summarise what I've been teaching today, almost all of today, isn't it? Uh, the goal of uh, preaching, amongst other things in Hebrews, is for us to hear the voice of God and to see what God says in his word. And what's the goal of our hearing and seeing? It's a common liturgical eschatological vision rather than an individual mystical experience. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in scholarly literature about mystical experiences. There's a fascination with mystical experiences and particularly visionary experiences and a lot of that's been fueled by drug taking and what happens when you are, are, are under drugs. And it's true that you see visions when you are, the normal barriers are broken. Uh, uh, visions of good and evil, uh, you have all sorts of visionary experiences. And so uh, there's a fascination about spirituality, the spiritual nature of things. Remember we started off there, uh, the invisible world. And so people try to replicate uh, or avoid the dangers that comes from tripping on drugs. And so there's a fascination with mystical experiences. Uh, now, how can you um, uh, induce, promote, uh, create mystical experiences, visionary experiences? I can give you a pretty good recipe if you want to have that. <laughs> And without taking drugs. What is it? What is it? Yeah, uh, what, what is the thing? Okay, fast. Fasting. Uh, um, combined with certain forms of meditation. Okay, certain forms of meditation and certain kinds of fasting. Uh, 
And then, uh, if you're disciplined enough, you'll have a mystical experience. What's the problem? It comes from you. And if it only came from you, it wouldn't bother me half as much as uh, the thing that happens most common. It could be satanic, but in that experience, light is confused with darkness and darkness is confused with light. And you can't distinguish what is spiritually good with, from what is spiritually evil. Okay? Uh, there's a fascination with mystical experiences. Huge literature. Uh, and a lot of people are into it. Um, I don't think it's quite so much now as of the hippie generation, and you still get a lot of ageing hippies that are tripping down this lane. Um, okay. Uh, and they, they get a bit of help from marijuana and some other uh, uh, in, in, uh, 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 helps. Uh, but okay, well what's the difference between that mystical tripping which seems to take you up into a spiritual realm? Well number one, that's individual, it's personal. I could be having a mystical experience now but you don't have the same experience. And even if you have a mystical experience, uh, your experience will be different too mine. Now, uh, uh, there is, if you like, a kind of mysticism that Hebrews is talking about, but not mysticism. It has to do with a real mystery. What's the real mystery? The mystery of Christ, the Son of God, the one who links heaven and earth, brings them together, the one who uh, brings heaven to earth and brings earth to heaven, uh, the one who is present in the divine service and who, uh, whom we hear and see in the divine service. And this is, it's a personal experience, but it's also a communal experience. It's not as if this is given to some super spiritual people, but it's given to every single Christian. It's available to every single Christian who comes to church, hears the word of God, and receives the Holy Supper. Okay? Uh, uh, that uh, uh, experience of, of mystery from participation by faith in the divine service, by not just hearing the voice of God, but doing what? Seeing what God's Word says and gives to the whole congregation here and now. And uh, to some extent, that changes so much because then we see uh, uh, worshipped in, in different terms. We see what looks like a rather boring earthly enactment in heavenly terms. Uh, we see our pastor in different light because if I'm going to see my pastor rightly, I need to look beyond his humanity and I need to see that he's fronting for Jesus. Uh, that his words are the words of Christ. Luther, in a number of remarkable passages in, uh, in preaching on John's Gospel, says about uh, people coming home from church and saying, today I saw God. Today I heard God. Today God reached out and touched me. I saw God where? In the face of my pastor. I heard the voice of God saying, you are my beloved son, you're my beloved daughter, through the mouth of my pastor. I received the heavenly gifts of God, the Holy Spirit, from the hands of my pastor in Holy Communion. Uh, theophany in and through the divine service. Uh, if you want to uh, explore that best of all in Luther, read his uh, uh, sermons on John's Gospel, uh, which, in which, however, he's not all that original because he's merely reclaiming and recapturing what you find everywhere in the uh, in patristic literature, in the great uh, fathers of the early church. Uh, a common liturgical experience, a, a vision of heavenly things here on earth. And if I could just do a little bit of an aside here, uh, uh, 
that's one of the reasons for the importance of good architecture, uh, liturgical art and liturgical music. Because what they do is to help you to realise that they, uh, when we come into church, we're not just going into a hall to listen to a star speaker doing a talk chat show. Uh, but all of that shows you to some extent, the architecture is meant to show you, this is a different place. Here heaven comes down to earth. Uh, what happens here is unlike anything that happens anywhere on earth, it's heavenly. Uh, and the, uh, so the architecture, the artwork and the music is meant, is, can help to show you this is heaven here on earth. Um, that used to be very much a part of uh, Christian heritage, but also our Lutheran heritage, which seems to be fading, sadly. Um, I don't know uh, how much of it's being kept alive and being uh, revitalised in your church. Okay, end of the session. This part, any questions, any remarks, any brilliant insights? <laughs> or unbrilliant <laughs> insights, as the case may be. Yes? How do you, the emphasis upon the experience that you refer to through the divine service, it's, I don't question that, it's just the interesting thing is how it is disdained because it is not, as some would say, unique to me. It's almost like, yes. I, I don't know how to explain it, it but it, it's like the, that I have to have my own personal experience of Jesus' presence. It's more the heart thing instead of the experience as conveyed through <clears throat> the work and the word in the service. Yes. And yes. Is that a, the challenge that you face? In that's, that's the challenge we face because the old Adam in us uh, uh, wants uh, to be promoted. Uh, 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 one of the things that our society basically tells all of us that we're really not, rather not significant. We're unimportant, unimpressive, unattractive people. I mean, how many women are beautiful according to our society? You know, there's a half a dozen uh, uh, film stars. The rest just don't measure up. And so do you realise that what's at 75% of women in the USA are severely uh, dissatisfied with their bodies and the way they appear? I mean, that's appalling. Uh, I don't know what the statistics are for men, but with this metrosexual movement, uh, more and more uh, 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 young men uh, have to shape up and have the buff kind of body to present themselves. Uh, uh, that's just physically, but in a thousand different ways, our society tells us we're really insignificant, unimportant, unattractive, etc. And so what, we are, uh, what are we looking for? We want some Thing that tells us that I count, that I'm significant, uh, that I matter. And we carry that across into church and we want some kind of experience which singles us out and makes us different to other people, special in some way. So we want God to promote us at the expense of other people. Whereas God does promote us, but not individually, he promotes us corporately, uh, instead of singling out a few of us as saints, he singles all of us out as saints. Instead of singling a few of us out as his uh, beloved sons and daughters, he singles all of us out as beloved sons and daughters. Beautiful in his eyes. Instead of saying to a few people, you know, the superstars like uh, Lessing here, who's written how many commentaries, and he's been in seminary, and he's pastor. Look, he's had such an amazing career. He's a superstar, okay? Uh, instead of singling some of us out uh, as being uh, uh, special in some way, what does he do? He singles us all out. Uh, 
uh, and he says to all of us, he doesn't just say to read, and sorry, I, don't, I hope you don't mind me taking you because uh, I figure you can be chucked off in a good Australian way. I'm giving you some, some Australian treatment as a fellow Old Testament scholar, uh, and you can, you can pay me back in kind with interest uh, the next occasion you wish. I'll give you a license and, and an absolution in advance. <laughs> Uh, instead of saying to a few significant people in the church, uh, you know, your Matt Harrisons and the Pope and a few people like that, look, uh, you're my beloved son, I'm well pleased with you. Those words that he spoke to Jesus, who does Jesus say those words? You're my beloved son, you're my beloved daughter, I'm well pleased with you. Every one of us. Personally, not individually, personally and corporately. <coughs> So uh, uh, we are glorified, to use a biblical term, not individually, but we are glorified corporately. Uh, he says this to the whole community. Remember how Jesus presents us to the Father and to the world? Look, see, me and the disciples, the children that God has given me. Where, can I follow, the, I guess, that's a huge part of it. The other part is how much I see this, especially with members here within the last two or three months, that they look to the experience as the sacramental verification. They have a relationship with God as well. Yes. And how much that's almost being wholesaled through media and through many of the non-denominational churches. Yes. Yes. And I, just trying to walk that edge between those two. Yes. Uh... I mean, just because we don't base our faith on experience, we need to, we, we, you know, to avoid one danger, we go to the other danger, which is to deny experience. In the same way, uh, we don't base our faith on feeling, at least the form, form of conquest, and that's very important because that's a very fickle foundation. But uh, we go for that and we negate the importance of feelings. Uh, it's that fine line. Uh, uh, but I think uh, uh, you know, a book like Hebrews helps us quite well in this. Because what is it that counts is the Jesus and his word to us. And Jesus doesn't uh, uh, sort of promote, Jesus doesn't come here to earth to promote himself and say, wow, look at me, the greatest super man, super God. He doesn't promote himself, he humbles himself in order to do what? To promote us. Way beyond our wildest imagination, he promotes us. Uh, so that we, the church, sit with him at the right hand of the Father. We are called to share in his glory, his status as son, his life as son, his inheritance as the son of God, all that stuff. Uh, uh, if you think in terms of feeling, how does God the Father feel towards us? He loves us intensely. He loves us intensely. How intensely does he love us? He gave his son. What? He gave his son. Yeah, he gave his son, and it's even better than that. He not only gave his son, you could say, okay, uh, you know, they're pretty good. Here you are, I will give you my son. How does God love us in exactly the same way as he loves Jesus? How does he feel towards us the way he feels towards Jesus? Um, how does he feel towards us? Uh, he has compassion on us the way Jesus has compassion on us. Just uh, 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 God uh, is so extravagant in dealing with us, in reaching out to where we are, and in promoting us so high. But he, uh, he does it in such a way that we don't get big-headed about it. Um, so let's just say, OK, uh, sometimes I get a, a very a, a opinionated picture of myself. Um, uh, so to stop me from getting too high and mighty, uh, God does something a bit unusual. He gives me a wife. <laughs> and she's nowhere half as effective as my children. 
Uh, you, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, right uh, 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 He brings us down to earth, uh, and that's within the order of creation. And not as much as our congregations either. That's it. Righto? Who's best? No, even in a good way. That's a well, negative way. But they cut me off at my knees from day one. Yeah, who is it that keeps you? Uh, and, and it's balanced because who is the one? Uh, how does God uh, show his approval to us? Most obviously spiritually, it's through fellow Christians, our congregation. But at the same time, how does he pull us into line? It's the same. Do right, you see the way God works? Yes. Provoking. Uh, we provoke one another to what? To uh, beautiful works. Yes, to beautiful works and love. Love and beautiful works. Um, uh, beautiful works which show the beauty of the giver, but also make the receiver, the one who is the, uh, receives the works, uh, beautiful. So we are called to if you like, beautify each other in such a way that we don't have to put on makeup and uh, 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 wear the best clothes in the world and uh, have the best house and the best car, those kind of things, the trappings. Uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's amazing then how, uh, given that context, that holy context, the beauty of people can emerge, the hidden beauty of people emerges in the most unlikely people in the most unlikely congregations. Yes? That process of provoking one another to, to love, I was, my first call, I was there for 14 years, was a congregation who had suffered much. Because you were there for 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> and they suffered even more after, but, uh, my, but uh, they, um, um, the process of provoking one another to love is deeply um, painful, yes. beautiful, intimate, yes. and um, it requires much patience. Yes, and all those are there in Hebrews are suffering, exactly. compassion, yep. suffering, and patience. Patience, endurance, perseverance, not giving up. So all this comes, uh, what, uh, uh, Jesus' promotion of us as holy people, as clean people, as uh, members of God's royal family. So we're part of the royal family, God's royal family, as saints, comes at a cost. What did it cost him? Well, it's life. And the same too in the church, it comes at a cost. Uh, well, you know, we won't have to suffer and die, necessarily, uh, but maybe uh, we might have to suffer persecution in the years to come. And uh, we're called to do so joyfully and graciously. Uh, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, dis endured the cross, despising the shame. People want to shame you, and that's the way they get back at you. Uh, despise the shame, uh, endure the cross for the sake of the joy. Any other things? Yes, sir, Jeff. I think of things in terms of like Paul writes in Romans 1 about all things are seen clearly through that which has been made so that we are without excuse. Yes. And I think of John 1.13 that we're born not by the will of man or the flesh but uh, or the will of man but of God. Yes. And everyone that's been a child, has been a parent, whatever, knows how intensely they love the children yes. that they can see. How much more the Father in heaven that conceives life in every one of us through the waters of baptism because of the work of Christ, that bond that he has as a father that has conceived that spiritual life in us. Yes. And I, I think that we don't put enough stock in that idea that God is truly a father that conceives a life in us and he has that bond with us. Yes, yes. It's not an idea, it's the reality. It is. And uh, uh, the thing also, 
the pain not the, just the suffering of Jesus, but the pain in the heart of God. Uh, love costs. Uh, there's pain, but his pain is our gain. His pain is our gain. Uh, vision. Uh, now we do not yet see the world all in order, subordinate to Christ, but what do we see? We see Jesus. We see Jesus who for a little while, or in a little degree, for a little while was made lower than the angels. So who, who was higher than the angels is human being uh, on the same level as us, so that uh, who is now crowned with glory and honour but he does that to bring many sons to where? To glory. His glory, the glory of the Father. Uh, he promises to bring us to a position that's not only the same level as the angels, but maybe even higher than the angels. Uh, in bringing many sons to glory, he uh, endures the cross. He, uh, he dies for us. We see Jesus humbled and crowned with glory and by seeing Jesus we see ourselves going that way together with Jesus. Uh, God humbles us, he brings us to our knees so that we receive glory and honour as the sons and daughters of the heavenly king, as those who stand together with God the Father, uh, uh, together with Jesus in the presence of God the Father and share in the Father's glory. Uh, look, this is just such a stupendous, wonderful vision. Um, uh, now, quite often uh, the danger is that we see people rejecting God and we try to argue them into faith or we try to ba Bible bash them into coming to church. What's the tr problem with arguing people into faith, Bible bashing people, nagging them, manipulating them? It's not the way of Jesus and it's totally counterproductive. We are feeding the devil and doing the devil's work. Uh, it's not just counterproductive, but we are going the way of the devil. Uh, instead of arguing people into faith, you confess the faith. You confess the faith, and you confess the faith with your whole being. It's not just words, but your whole being, with your body, with your mouth, with your mind, with your imagination, in your emotions, in your actions, everything you do, you profess Jesus and you yourself embody the vision of heavenly things uh, as something that grips you. Uh, uh, what Jesus wants to do is to make your life a mystery. What kind of mystery? So not is to talk it to mystify you and make you secretive and say, oh, what, what gives with that person? But people say, this is a very ordinary person. And yet what? There's something rather extraordinary about this person that I can't put my finger on. A simple thing. A person who suffers a great deal, uh, but somehow is joyful, uh, and sorrowful at the same time. Sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Mystery. What gives here? Or a uh, mystery of somebody who, uh, 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 whenever uh, somebody does something rotten to them, doesn't re repay evil with evil, but repays evil with something beautiful. Uh, a lot, uh, to, we are called to be theophanic people, a theophanic congregations, uh, a theophanic church, 
Uh, why? Because in our bodies we bear God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, which means that every single person you and I come to today, uh, we bring God to them. They don't see God. What do they see? Us. And they see me as a sinner, and Satan makes it quite clear that we're a sinner. And yet, in some way, there's something mysterious that's going on here because we don't live and act. We don't think in the same way. We don't have the same values as the world. Uh, we are the light of the world, theophanic term. Uh, we are the salt of the earth, uh, bringing Jesus with us wherever we go. And uh, sometimes that's shown most clearly, uh, not when we're most perfect, but when we're sin, when we've sinned, both when we've sinned and been sinned against, that's when the grace of God uh, is most clearly revealed in us and in our communities. Yes? yes. Your, your comments about not arguing people into the faith, in, in many ways one could maybe speak of that as that, that's the, the preaching of the way of death. Yes. Right? And it makes me think about how often I've had conversations with, I don't like this word, the, the, the delinquents, those who, have, who are not present in, in the divine service, um, when you really begin to talk to them and you, get, you begin to realize they're quite often their confirmation experience they're, they're, was tremendously negative. You know, because mom told me to be there, or I had to, or dad would do this. And, and, and the they, pastor was a grumpy old man. Exactly. And they look back to that time of their life when it was supposed to be formative and be given a vision, and they were literally provided a way of death by the church. And the church indoctrinated them out of the mystery instead of initiating them exactly. into the mystery. And we sit there and we ponder what's all going on, and the problem is the church, period. Okay, but, uh, but, you, we can, we, we okay, but you need to balance it. Okay, please. Righto. Yeah, the problem's the church, but also the Society. the solution is the church. Yeah, absolutely. And even the most rotten congregation is what? A communion of saints is the bride of Christ. And without, in God's eyes, human eyes, uh, she's a prostitute. But in God's eyes, she's the bride of Christ. Holy, beautiful without spot or stain or wrinkle or any such thing. Um, uh, 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 we need to see in a measured way, have a measured vision of spiritual realities. And most of the time they are paradoxical. They're not the way things appear to be, but they turn appearances on their head. Uh, can I just say, just give it an obvious thing? If you look objectively at what's happening I don't know about the USA, but what's happening in Australia, there seems to be little or no future for the church. You get statisticians who say, if the churches decline in the way they have, statistically, by the year 2050, there won't be any Christians anymore. That's totally reasonable. You can prove it statistically. And many Christians are buying into that, and there's a sense of panic in the church that we've got to do something to turn things around. Uh, is that the way Jesus sees it? When Jesus looks at Australian society, he doesn't see a barren desert where there's no hope for the church, there's no future for the church, but he sees a, a harvest that is ripe for the harvesting. All that he needs is people to bring in the harvest. The opportunities for the church are unparalleled around the world, uh, but you won't see that with human eyes. Yes? So in dealing with these, these people who have been indoctrinated out of the church, is that what you said? Yes. Is, is I've had the practice of, of saying, you, you've been given a wrong picture. Yes. And I, I guess I, I want to show, tell them that, hey, this, what it really is, is not that. Yes. There's something else that you, that you have. And is that, you have a... That's perfect, but it won't, particularly with young people, it won't wash with them unless something else. Yeah, exactly. Something. What's that something else? Jesus is the vision. Well, they won't, they won't uh, 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 be able to see Jesus abstractly. That you've got to embody that yourself. Okay? 
that they see the kindness of Jesus, the gentleness of Jesus, and picky the joy of the Lord in you. Uh, and the compassion and the kindness, the gentleness, the attentiveness, all those things uh, uh, that you will model as a spiritual, just as an earthly father models to his children, so you as a spiritual father are called not just to, 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 to teach that vision, but to embody that vision. Right? Uh, that's what I maintain Hebrews is about in many different ways. Okay, any final things? Because I don't think it's worth uh, introducing anything new. Brilliant insights. Last chance to talk about this. Now tomorrow I want to speak about um, Jesus the High Priest and the work of Jesus as High Priest uh, and his work in our midst uh, as a High Priest. And the key uh, 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 image is of Jesus as Christos. Now this is a picture. Uh, uh, this is Jesus is Christos. Now uh, the Hebrew word is Mashiach, Christos, which comes from the verb to anoint. He is the anointed one. And he has been anointed with uh, in the Old Testament, uh, there were two uh, classes of people that were anointed with the most holy anointing all. The king was anointed with the most holy anointing all. That's what we usually think of in the New Testament. But even before that, and more commonly, priests were anointed with the most holy anointed all. Now Jesus is anointed as our priest and king. Now that's the picture. He has pr he's, he's a priestly office, he's got priestly work, and he's got royal work. And the interesting thing is that they aren't two separate things, but they are one and the same thing. He is a priestly king and a kingly priest. And we likewise then are called to serve together with Jesus as priestly kingly people. Right, as members of Christ's priesthood or high priesthood and as royal sons and daughter, daughters doing the kin, king's work, working together with the heavenly king who is our brother, Jesus. So we're part of the royal family, we're part of the high priesthood of uh, Jesus. That'll do for today.